Seeing no further introductions, it's therefore time for member statements. The member from Huron, Bruce. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. On behalf of the PC Party of Ontario, I'd like to make the following statement. Saturday, November 25th, marks the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. Unfortunately, violence is a daily reality for countless of women and girls throughout the world. Sadly, Canada and Ontario are not immune to this fact. Every day, women and children across Ontario and Canada are affected by violence, and it's estimated that one in three women around the world will experience violence in their lifetime. On any given night in Canada, over 3,000 women and their children sleep in shelters because it is not safe at home. This is unacceptable. We as a society need to work together to put an end to this needless violence. The elimination of violence against women is just not a woman's issue. It's a problem that impacts us all. Both men and women must stand united and advocate for change. We must continue to work together to raise awareness of violence against women and shine a light on the abuse and offer support to victims. The International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women serves as an important reminder to join in on the conversation and stand up against all gender-based violence. I would like to thank all the various organizations and individuals that work tirelessly to raise, to raise awareness for this important issue. Let us all stand together and eliminate violence. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Further member statements? The member from Kitchener, Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It's an honour to stand up today on the Trans Day of Remembrance about the YMC Sprott House, Ontario's first LGBTQ and transitional housing program for youth. Last week, I visited Sprott House, and it was clear that the staff, including Director Kate Miller, worked tirelessly to provide a safe, supportive, and welcoming space for LGBTQ youth. Sprott House provides residential living for 25 youth, and it is always at full capacity, with a wait list of more than 40. For these youth, this is the first place they have ever lived where they feel safe. LGBTQ youth are disproportionately represented among homeless youth, constituting 40% of all homeless youth. The challenges they face are unique, and trans youth especially are more likely to experience discrimination and violence in shelters. Sprott House gives its residents a safe place to call home and the support they need to continue their education and find a job. With affordable housing and short supply, shelters like Sprott House and the GTA struggle to keep up with demand. For example, the Toronto Transitional Housing Allowance Program, which helped Toronto families pay for their market set rent, was cancelled because it was so successful that it exhausted its funds. Affordable housing is essential to building a strong economy and an equitable society. They, to reach their full potential, youth need stable and affordable housing. We need to continue to support groups like the YMCA who work to put a roof over everyone's head. A sincere thank you to the YMCA for leading the way. Clearly, this is a model of transitional housing that needs to be replicated across the province. Thank you. Thank you. For the member, Seamus, the member from Barrie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On October the 27th, I had the privilege of attending the grand opening of the Barry Military Heritage Park. The opening had a remarkable turnout of dignitaries, veterans, peacekeepers, and ser serving members of the Canadian Forces and residents of Barry. Loca located along the beautiful south shore of Kempenfelt Bay, the park serves as an important commemoration of Barry's deep military history. It is fitting that this park opened just a few days before Remembrance Day where we all had a chance to honour the memories of those who have served and those who paid the ultimate sacrifice for our nation. The park features 25 Vimy oak saplings descended from acorns sent back to Canada after the Battle of Vimy Ridge. An obelisk commemorates those who have been awarded the Victoria Cross, including Barry's own honorary Lieutenant Colonel Reverend John Weir Foote. It also features an art installa installation of three steel panels depicting tulips, signifying the liberation of Holland, poppies, our national symbol of remembrance, and feathers in tribute to the military contributions of indi Indigenous peoples. For years to come, this park will continue to serve as a lasting tribute to Barry's military heritage, including our very close relationship with CFB Borden and the Gray and Simcoe Foresters. I know that generations of families will enjoy this park and learn about the incredible men and women in uniform who have made this possible. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Whitby, Oshawa. Thank you. There is no person more centrist and inoffensive as Steve Pakin. He even wrote a great book on former Premier Bill Davis. Yet Lindsay Shepard, a teaching assistant at Laurier, has been censured 
by Wilfrid Laurier University for showing a clip from Steve Pakin's television program, The Agenda, to introduce her lecture in her class. Later, a student complained about the content, and Lindsay was called to a meeting with the two professors and an, an official from the university's diversity and equity office. Lindsay is now concerned that the professors will take away her teaching assistant position, which alongside a scholarship is paying for her studies. Speaker, this is not about left versus right. This is about academic freedom. This is about freedom of speech. Speaker, this is about a university targeting a vulnerable teaching assistant, threatening her academic career and her source of livelihood. As a result, Lindsay was quoted in a Waterloo Region record feature saying, I now feel so completely alienated from the university as an institution. On behalf of the Ontario Progressive Conservative Caucus, I express my solidarity with Lindsay Shepherd. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you for the member's statement. The member from Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. This past weekend, we celebrated a special milestone in Oshawa. The Durham Region Labour Council marked 75 years of activism, advocacy and impact. Labour councils are the local action organizations under the umbrella of the Canadian Labour Congress. These councils have members from affiliated unions who come together to strengthen our communities. I remember the first meeting I attended as an ETFO member with larger-than-life Jim Freeman as president. After hearing from the local affiliates about health and safety issues, about unfair and concerning employer challenges, and about charitable or advocacy campaigns across our community, I was hooked. And, Speaker, I was also proud to later serve for a time as our Labour Council's second vice president. Labour councils are where workers and community partners recognize our shared values and goals. It's where I really recognize that regardless of the workplace, we are all workers in Ontario and deserve fairness, respect and safe work environments. We are all in this together. Jim Freeman always stood up for Labour councils and recognized them to be the boots on the ground of the Labour movement. They are the grassroots of change and advocacy. Durham is fortunate to have a strong community Labour Council with leaders and workers who have come together since 1942 to make change happen. I would like to recognize President John McDonald, the current executive, and long-serving staff Linda McLaughlin for their commitment to Oshawa and Durham Region. Our Labour Council has been building bridges, making workplaces and community spaces safer and stronger, and has been making our community better for 75 years. Thank you. Thank you for the member statements. The member from Eglinton Lawrence. Speaker, I'm here today to uh, pass on uh, my comments about the passing of a, a good friend and uh, a very uh, renowned uh, judge that passed away uh, November the 2nd, uh, Paul French. Paul uh, was uh, born in Ottawa, went to Ottawa U, and uh, also. Uh, married a, uh, a very significant lawyer uh, in uh, Mickey Smith, uh, Michelle Smith, and uh, they uh, have two wonderful children, uh, Michael uh, and uh, Laura, who miss their father greatly. Paul French uh, was the uh, nephew of uh, one of Canada's most renowned criminal lawyers, the Arthur Maloney, and he articled with his uncle Arthur before he went into practice. He was called to the bar uh, in uh, 1984, practice law, and uh, he also uh, helped establish this framework agreement between uh, judges and the Ontario government, which has been copied across Canada. He was appointed a judge in 2006, and he helped establish the first uh, mental health assistance unit at Metro West Detention. He was very concerned about mental health and how it affects uh, our incarcerated uh, men and women, especially our youth. He uh, also spent a lot of time uh, trying to ensure that uh, our uh, young people uh, were given, especially marginalized youth, were given the attention they needed beyond just being uh, dealt with by the full weight <coughs> of the law. So uh, I want to say thank you, uh, Paul, Judge French, for your long life of service. Thank you. <clears throat> For the member statements, the member from Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in the House today to draw attention to the problem of volunteer firefighter recruitment in rural communities throughout our province. 85% of firefighters in Canada are volunteers. In communities smaller than 5,000 people, 99% of firefighters are volunteers. 
Rural communities rely upon volunteer firefighters to respond to both medical and fire-related emergencies. Unfortunately, many rural communities are wor worried about recruiting enough volunteer firefighters to meet their needs. My, in my writing, Councillor Shane Baker has reported that the Huntsville Lake of Bays Fire Department is, quote, stretched because of problems with recruitment, especially with regards to remote fire homes. Gravenhurst and Bracebridge are facing similar challenges. Local fire departments are working hard to increase recruitment. In particular, I wish to commend Huntsville Lake of Bays Fire Department, which ran Camp Female Firefighters in Training Program this past summer. This was a new program from my riding of Perry Sound, Muskoka. Seven women between the ages of 15 and 18 participated participated, and they learned specialized fire and rescue skills such as vehicle extraction. I wish to conclude by thanking our volunteer firefighters. These local heroes commit to rigorous training routines and are often the first to arrive and provide life-saving support for their neighbors. One such local hero is District Chief Mike Cook, who recently retired after 40 years as a volunteer firefighter with the Huntsville Lake of Bays Fire Department. I congratulate him on his retirement, and I commend him on his many years of service. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. The member statements. The member from Davenport. Thank you, Speaker, and I rise in the House today to, to congratulate the Toronto Argonauts, a team with a never say die attitude. Right. Hey. Full credit to the Saskatchewan Rough Riders on the last gasp display, worthy of a sports movie. But with two minutes and 37 seconds left, Ricky Ray said, and I'm going to quote Mr. Speaker, we had plenty of time. We weren't in a rush. I'm proud of the Argos for the first time since 2012. The team is headed to the Great Cup, which will be hey. happening this Sunday, November 26th in Ottawa. Toronto's defenders intercepted the ball three times in the opening 30, 30 minutes. No small feat. And heroics from Ricky Ray and Toronto's defence have set up quite a great cup final. The Argos versus the Calgary Stampeders. I look forward to watching these two teams play an intense football game. I know the Argos are coming into the final as an underdog. Mr. Speaker, the Stampeders have the best regular season record in the CFL, but if my boys in blue can survive a last minute on they can do anything. I'm hoping for a storybook finish to the season for the Argos. Best of luck to the Stampeders, but if the game goes as running back James Wilder says, they'll be in, man, and it worked out just as we prepared. So join me in saying, let's go, go Argos! Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Lanark, Front Athletic and Addington. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, I'd like to acknowledge and congratulate Dr. Robin Kenny of Perth, Ontario, who has been awarded the 2017 College of Family Physicians Community Teacher of the Year Award. The award, which will be presented to Dr. Kennedy at the OFCP Award Ceremony in Toronto this week on the 23rd, celebrates excellence in community family medicine education and is handed out based on nominations by family medicine students and residents. Dr. Kenny plays a very important role in the Perth community, not only as the chief of the Perth Hospital Emergency Department, but as an investigating coroner for the region as well. Dr. Kenny is both well-respected and highly praised for his invaluable knowledge of rural community medicine by his students at Queen's University, as well as his residents from the University of Ottawa. He has had a profound impact on his residents and students, and many apply to work in Perth. Combined with his continued mentorship of former students and residents, he is a model for a healthy work and a life balance, and is a model and testament to the value and commitment to rural medicine. I hope everyone will join me in congratulating Dr. Kennedy for this well-deserved honour. Thank you. I thank all members for their statements. It's therefore now time for reports by committees. Reports